Um, I'm so glad to be here. And I'm so glad to have Aaron and Uri here. Um, you probably don't know this, but Aaron is actually calling in from the United Kingdom where it is four in the morning. So thank you very much, Aaron, for waking up in the middle of the night to join this panel with us here. Very welcome, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone. And in this panel, <laughs> what we're gonna talk about is the way the YC community has been responding to COVID-19. And um, the, the majority of it I want to have as a discussion with Aaron and Uri, who are both actually currently running companies that are doing incredibly fascinating and important work in the fight against COVID-19. And they're going to tell you all about their stories of like how they decided to work on this and everything that they've done. Um, but before we get into their personal stories, I wanted to take five minutes or less than that um, to flip through a few examples of other YC companies that are also doing things with COVID-19, just so that you get a sense of some of the cool things that startups are doing and the cool way that entrepreneurs can make a difference. Um, so I am going to share some slides because I have some pictures here. Okay. So um, between March and April, over 50 YC companies launched responses to COVID-19. And I was just incredibly impressed and proud of all of them for doing this. Because all of these are companies that were doing something really important before COVID hit. They had a whole business that they had raised money for, they had hired employees for, they had a whole plan for. And a lot of them basically took that plan and ripped it up and wrote a whole new plan on the spot because they saw something in the world that needed to be done and they saw an opportunity to help out. And they took whatever assets and skill sets they had and they just uh, pivoted on the spot. And to me, this is sort of emblematic of a startup mentality. Like this is a thing that like only startups can do. Big companies can't really do this, but startups that are being run by their founders can make incredibly fast decisions. And it's this kind of mentality, COVID or not, that I think makes Silicon Valley. And so hopefully in addition to sort of these COVID-19 stories, you'll get sort of a sense for the kind of mentality that permeates Silicon Valley. So here are five, uh, examples of these 50 companies in quick succession. Um, so the first one is this company called Solugen. And Solugen is a company that makes industrial hydrogen peroxide. So you can see uh, the photos, that is their factory where they produce the hydrogen peroxide and they sell it by the truckload. Um, and in April, they converted the entire factory over to a hand sanitizer factory. They figured out how to retrofit their equipment and repurpose the chemical recipes and just like change everything over to producing hydrogen peroxide, sorry, in, into producing hand sanitizer. And they ended up shipping some absurd amount of hand sanitizer, like I think a million liters of hand sanitizer to hospitals and schools and other places that needed it. So that was just, that was just so cool. Uh, the next one is this company called Aeon 3D and Aeon 3D makes 3D printers. They actually like assemble the 3D printers themselves and they have a huge facility filled with their 3D printers where they can 3D print anything. And so in March, they started 3D printing face shields, which were in really short supply, particularly for hospital workers that were doing uh, procedures. And they were able to rapidly spin up an assembly line and produce thousands and thousands of these face shields that they distributed to hospitals in Canada. Uh, the next company is a company called Flexport. And what Flexport does is they help companies ship products around the world. So if you're producing a product in China and you wanna ship it to the US, Flexport will 
arrange for transportation. They'll deal with import and export rules. They'll deal with taxes. They'll take care of all of the logistics for you. And um, when COVID hit, there is a massive need to move medical supplies from where they were being produced in the factories to where they were needed at the hospitals. And Flexport mobilized a whole team of employees to do this at scale. They donated all of their time and they were able to move gigantic amounts of medical equipment and to be far more nimble at doing it than existing transportation providers. And as an example of the kinds of things that they did, I have here a real photo. This is a plane that Flexport chartered. And as you can see, the seats that are normally meant for passengers are filled with like boxed medical equipment that was like tied down to the seats and lashes. Because at the time there was a huge shortage of cargo plane capacity, but a surplus of passenger plane capacity. And so Flexport realized that the fastest way to actually get this cargo was to charter unused passenger planes. Uh, I've got two more. This is a company called Care Message, which sends SMS messages for hospitals and other healthcare organizations. And when COVID hit, there was a massive need to get information out about testing sites, about protocols, about how to know if you have COVID symptoms. And um, they donated over 10 million SMS messages to healthcare organizations that needed to send these messages. Um, and the last one is a company called Ginkgo Bioworks, which was the first biotech company that YC funded. And um, Ginkgo Bioworks has sort of amazing infrastructure for doing all kinds of lab work in biology. They have DNA synthesis and all, all, all kinds of things. And they've donated about $25 million worth of use of that infrastructure to companies that are working on various COVID-19 efforts, including Moderna, which is one of the... Uh, leading efforts to make a COVID vaccine. And those are my five examples. With that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna turn it over to Aaron and Uri to talk about what they've been doing, which is just incredibly cool. So Aaron, do you wanna start maybe by telling us about what your company was doing before COVID? Yeah, absolutely, Jared. So uh, my company uh, is called Postdua, and we focus on applying uh, machine learning techniques to problems in drug discovery. There are many problems in the kind of preclinical stage of drug discovery. Um, and a particular problem that we were really focused on is the question of how to make molecules. So this is the process known as chemical synthesis. And for anyone who's not aware, you can kind of think about this as almost doing chemical Lego. You start out with a set of basic materials that you can combine, and your aim is to try and combine these raw materials into something more complex that ultimately becomes a potential drug candidate that you test. Um, and that is a really challenging problem. There are currently about 10 billion starting materials across the internet that you could purchase. And you can imagine that combining them is this kind of like exponentially and growing problem. Um, and, and you can use machine learning to help you with that process. So we were busy. We were trying to work with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies and, um, effectively trying to take this chemical synthesis technology and use it to speed up drug discovery in the labs of the partners we were working with. Awesome. awesome. And how was what you were doing in March when everything blew up? Yeah, so when everything, when the world blew up, uh, we were currently going through Y Combinator. Both Yuri and Jared uh, were my Council and partners at Y Combinator. And lockdown, at least in California, happened a couple of days after we opened our fundraising round. So there were many things you shouldn't do when trying to raise money. And ideally, avoiding pandemics is a, is a good checklist to, to go with. 
So what were we doing? We were panicking. It's the kind of basic answer. Uh, but we were meeting investors or trying to meet investors. And we're just coming to the end of three months of really intense work uh, going through Y Combinator. That was a crazy time. Uh, yeah, it was. I think we, 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 we were worried that we, we may have to delay the fundraise. Uh, we were worried I might have to move back to rainy London forever. Um, there, was, there, there was a lot of worry, but I, 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 can, I can say that Y Combinator and the infrastructure and the ecosystem like any good startup, responded super quick, was nimble enough to allow us to get in front of investors. And we're jumping ahead here, but you know, we, uh, I, I spoke to 45 investors in the course of five days during the first five days of a pandemic. And like, that was because you guys and YC responded quickly, like we were trying to do. Uh, and, and so it's very, very in keeping with spirit of what YC promotes. Awesome. And um, now is a good time to sort of segue into the COVID moonshot and everything that you spun up. Yep. In March. So tell us the story of that. Yep. So to go all the way back, we were obviously aware of the pandemic, but we, we had no intention to develop a drug. To be honest with you, we had our own thing going on with partnership agreements. But one day we basically saw a tweet that was put out from a group at the University of Oxford, which are called uh, Diamond, Diamond Light Source. And effectively, what these guys had done was run what's known as a fragment screen against the main protease of COVID. Um, effectively, you can think about a fragment screen as firing uh, like mini jigsaw pieces of drugs at a given protein target. So um, they had originally taken work that was done very, very quickly out of some labs in China um, who had effectively figured out the crystal structure of the main protease. Um, now, the main protease is effectively a key piece of machinery within the COVID virus that is responsible for its replication. So if you can somehow block up this particular replication mechanism, you have a really good chance at shutting down the virus. So they had got the crystal structure of this main protease, and they effectively found around 80 different kind of fragments, or think about them as kind of like mini drugs, uh, or very, very kind of jigsaw pieces of drugs. So they found around 80 of them that seemed to sit and seemed to fit quite well in this particular main protease. So you can think about it as a lock and a key. There's this lock, which is the protein you're trying to shut down and you've got all these potential keys. And 80 of them kind of looked promising. And they published this on Twitter. And um, we basically realized that, hey, if you can combine several of these jigsaw pieces, you can start to work toward potential drug candidates for COVID. And, oh, hey, the very technology that we are working on is how to stitch pieces of chemistry together. How coincidental. So we basically sent out a tweet saying, hi, um, we can do chemical Lego. Can we be of assistance? Um, your data is already in the open, so why don't we keep it like that? Um, and basically over a weekend, our CTO and, and the founders, including myself, basically spun up a website. And the idea of the website, Jared, was any scientist around the world could look at these particular fragments and suggest a way to combine them into something that could be then tested um, as uh, in, in an assay against the main protease. So we built the website and I think we kind of hoped for like maybe 50 or 100 submissions. Um, and to date, we have about 13,000 submissions now from scientists around the world. So that was the start. It kind of started from a tweet, basically. Tell us more about how the website actually works. 
So the website has, uh, I guess, uh, two, uh, three different main functionalities. The first is that you can take a look at these original 80 fragments that were shown to be um, potential binders to the main protease. And you can effectively draw a structure that you think is a potential merge of these fragments, or you can just draw any old chemical structure that you think could be a good drug candidate for COVID. Um, and then you can just submit that to our site. Uh, so that's the first thing. Users and scientists around the world can input ideas. We've had uh, about 410 unique contributors uh, submit around 13,500 ideas. Now, once you've submitted an idea, what you can then do uh, is, is effectively track not only your submission, but everyone else's submissions as well. So we effectively provide um, several different pieces of data. Uh, we provide actual images of these fragments that are in the main protease. So from a structural analysis, you can have a look at how well they sit in the binding pocket. You can have a look at kind of where you can extend the chemistry to um, either go deeper into the binding pocket or move away from it. So you've got the structural base analysis. Um, what's been amazing is we've now had 25 organizations around the world donate experimental support and uh, chemical manufacturing support almost for free or certainly at discounted rates. So not only have we got 13,500 ideas, we've then actually experimentally tested about 1,200 of these ideas and then put all of the data back up on the website. So the first functionality is submit ideas. The second functionality is track the status of other compounds, including your own. And then the third kind of functionality is we, we provide an easy way to download all of this data. Um, do we hope that COVID Moonshot can find an antiviral cure? Absolutely. But we want this data to help inform anyone else in the world who is also working on a cure as well. So they're like the three different ways you can engage with the COVID Moonshot site. Aaron, can I share a link to the site in the chat so that people can actually go and check it out themselves? Absolutely, yep. So it's just posterior.ai backslash COVID. Um, and you'll be able to see all the data that we have so far is up on there. Um, and I think if I can just mention, Jared, like I think what, what we are most excited about from this kind of perspective is... Um, there are two things. If, if you take a look at what happened with SARS uh, in 2000 and uh, 2002, 2003, one of the main problems that you faced was when that particular pandemic receded, there was very little follow-up or there was very little R&D work that continued. Um, and there was certainly very limited centralization of data and experimental porting of what was tested during that time for that particular coronavirus strain. That meant it became much harder in this COVID-19 coronavirus strain to be on the front foot and be responsive. So one of the things we hope is that um, there will be another coronavirus strain at some point in the future, like that's not a pessimist point of view. That's just kind of reality. And we hope that at least COVID Moonshot can help provide a step forward in the right direction, given all of the research and the data that has been done so far. And Aaron, can you talk about how what you're doing relates to open source? Because I think there's a fascinating analogy there. Um, yeah, absolutely. So open source is generally associated with the computer science community. And I think in, in, in recent kind of years has certainly gained um, a significant amount of traction. Um, in the area of drug discovery, you tend to struggle to get much traction with open source. And the reason therein is because 
the R&D that is required to get a drug to market is so high that investors generally need to see intellectual property attached to the asset in order to fund your work. And this makes sense. Um, it also obviously provides a kind of um, closed um, security net for your company to know that your idea won't just be taken by kind of somebody else. But I guess what we realized with COVID moonshot was two things. Firstly, by not having any patent around the idea, we could firstly, if we do find a cure, have very little R&D costs to recuperate, which means we should be able to produce an antiviral that is cheap and accessible to everybody. And this is particularly important because certainly in infectious disease breakout and in pandemics, it tends to be rich developed nations that get access to cures much faster than developing nations. Um, and we hope by having a lower price point on the antiviral we can produce, that it would remove that type of inequality that you tend to see. So the first thing of the benefit of the open source from a drug discovery perspective is it's cheap. The second thing I would say is um, it enables us, us to move very quickly. We have 25 organizations involved. We don't have time to discuss who owns what and who is going to file a patent on what. There are just too many slow academics, with all due respect to academics, trying to figure out what to do. So we basically said, okay, let's just get rid of that. Let's just all work on this together so we can move quickly. And then the third thing that is the benefit is that um, you can help the rest of the world. And the data we put out via the open source model means a lot of people should hopefully be able to see moonshot data and help inform their own drug discovery efforts. Um, I don't think that open source is a solution to all drug discovery efforts. But I think what's really amazing is you've got a global global interconnected community all want to solve COVID. And so while ever you've got that momentum around a project, open source can be a really powerful way to leverage that community spirit to try and get something done very quickly. And can you talk about some of the people that have participated in this effort? I remember there being some really incredible people. Yeah, so I guess we have... Uh, three different tranches of people, if you will. Um, we can kind of break up these people into those who are designing molecules, those who are making molecules, and those who are testing molecules. Um, on the design stage, um, we've had large pharma uh, who have donated like 10% of their entire medicinal chemistry efforts to COVID Moonshot to help improve designs and provide feedback on the designs that the community is submitting. So you've got all the way from large pharma, um, all the way down to very niche, uh, by a very niche consulting firms, um, kind of set up by Pfizer executives. We have um, one in particular that is called um, Pharma Consulting, very inventive name, uh, that has two Pfizer executives, both spent 20 years there. They've been contributing expertise. Um, we also work with an organization called Folding at Home. Uh, Folding at Home are the kind of world's largest supercomputer. And it's, again, a kind of crowdsourced approach where anybody can contribute their compute power. And we are using Folding at Home's compute power to do protein simulations and to try and look at the way that the actual protein uh, interacts with the ligand, with, with the actual drug candidates, and try and use that to identify the most um, promising drug uh, the most promising drug candidates to select. So you've got the kind of what we might call traditional pharmaceutical um, folks involved. You've got supercomputing. Um, technology being contributed. Um, we then have uh, three different CROs, so chemical manufacturers around the world, who have offered either totally free chemical synthesis or at least heavily discounted. So for example, an organization called SAI in India uh, is, is contributing several chemists for free for several months just to make compounds for COVID moonshot, which is just really amazing and really generous. Um, and then finally, on the experimental side, uh, we have two different labs, one in Israel 
and one in Oxford, UK, who are both doing uh, biochemical assays. So this is effectively taking the protein um, and soaking it with the actual drug target and measuring how well does it shut down the actual main protease replication function. Um, and, and again, if you are moving fast, like Moonshot is trying to, it's important to have validation. And so by having two different labs doing two different experiments, testing the same hypothesis, um, that is giving us a level of confidence in the results that, that we're seeing. That's incredible. And just for people who are on the call who might not know this, like this is the first time in history that anything like this has ever happened. This is the first open source drug development effort that's gotten to scale, right? If there were any earlier dr open source drug development efforts, they didn't get very far. Um, yes, yeah, so th there have been open source drug discovery efforts before um, in areas like malaria, but we, we believe uh, that this is certainly now the world's largest and most advanced from an open source perspective, yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're super proud of that. We've got a long way to go, uh, but, but the drug candidates are soon going into um, animal trials. So I spend my weekends trying to crowdsource hamsters and rats at the minute, uh, which is great fun. Um, and, and so, you know, by the end of the year, we hope to have some evidence of our drug candidates being used in animals and then potentially looking at human trials uh, next year. Um, so it's, it's really exciting, Jared. And again, if we had just not taken the risk of just pivoting and trying something, um, you know, just, just to be clear, posterior will make zero money, even if we find a cure. Um, we would have never had this amazing opportunity to try and lead this initiative. So it's, it's been really exciting. The incredible thing to me is the sort of outpouring of support across the world of all these disparate organizations and individuals that can help with some facet of drug development that are contributing like their time and skills and, and, and materials for free, just because it's like an open source effort. In that sense, to me, it's very reminiscent of the big open source software projects that get effectively billions of dollars of like free labor donated to them. And it, to me, it's just such a cool and powerful idea. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's such an incredible, idea and the 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 way that the community has rallied to support it is just phenomenal yeah it, it absolutely is and and, and it, it doesn't come without its challenges i mean you I, I think even under the crowdsource model um and an open source approach you definitely have to have some people calling the shots and you at a bare minimum have to have a really good organizational infrastructure because um 410 scientists all shouting at each other whose drug target candidate they're going to pick is, is not the most helpful way to find a cure. So I think so long as you have a good way to prioritize ideas, to provide feedback to the community so they feel involved and a very clear set of like timelines and a hypothesis so everyone knows what's going on i think open source can work can work really really well um and so and, and may i just actually add kind of posterior specific contribution as well is, is kind of not just this idea of hosting the website but how do you take thirteen thousand ideas and pick 1000 to actually test the way that moonshot has done it has actually been to identify which compounds are the most easily makeable because if you can find out which of the compounds are the most easily makeable, you can make them quickly and then iterate much faster than trying to do a, a seven-step chemical synthesis compared to a simple one-step chemical synthesis. So that's been kind of, as I mentioned to you before, we were working a lot on this problem of how to make molecules. And now making molecules has become the very filter in this open source approach that goes from the... 13,000 ideas down to the 1,000 ideas. So it's been really nice for us to have a real world validation of our technology. Um, we've actually just released the very tool that we use. It's called Manifold. I'd encourage anyone who's interested in chemical synthesis biotech to check out our website. Um, we hope that that's the tool that can be useful for you as well. Awesome. Okay, well with that, I want to turn it over to Uri to tell us about Pardes and what he's working on. That's a very hard act to follow. And uh, 
especially given that you're uh, talking about this at 3 a.m. your time. So it makes it you know, doubly impressive. Uh, so the story uh, began, I think I was sitting at one of the YC desks, uh, reading apps and working with some of the companies. And we were thinking, it, we were getting lots of inbound, how can we help? What can we do to help with COVID from all of the companies that were around YC, which was pretty fantastic. And I think it was Jeff, the pre, you know, Jeff Rolson, a YC president came over and, and said, well, Ray, what are you doing about COVID? It's like, damn it, why'd you have to ask me that? Uh, because as, as you know, by background, I'm an infectious disease doc and my last company was making small molecule drugs to try and cure hepatitis B. And so I couldn't get that thought now out of my head after Jeff asked me that for the next couple of uh, weeks and had been talking uh, in the background to my old chief scientific officer from my previous company, Lee Arnold, who is brilliant. I, he's the one, he's the person who invented Tarceva, an oncology drug. And when the pandemic broke out, he had this observation, you know, the main protease for the new SARS, this protein that the posterior is also interested in, looks really, really similar from the old SARS to the new one. And so we, had, we kept on talking about this and finally we decided, you know what, this, this is the most important problem in the world right now. We should try and do something about this. And coming back to the thesis that it is probably easier today to start a biotech company than ever before in history. You can, you can start a company with a credit card from your bedroom uh, and get experiments happening someplace in the world in real time. Uh, we started designing molecules based on work that had been left behind. Because as Aaron pointed out, there's an enormous amount of information that people had put into the world around SARS-1 and then just left there and not followed up on. And taking the very different approach of artisanal medicinal design as opposed to AI-based computational design, I uh, started thinking about how can we apply some modern uh, chemistries that have been developed since in the first SARS pandemic to try and turn some of these old drugs that didn't really work very well or never got fully developed into oral drugs to try and treat COVID. And the very simple thesis is, can we make the equivalent of a Tamiflu for coronavirus? Uh, because the, when we looked across all of the different coronaviruses that, and this is a significant number of the common colds as well that people get every year, it's not just SARS and MERS and COVID, there's a significant percentage of the common cold that also has the same protease. So it turns out that maybe you can actually finally make a, make a drug to treat the common cold. And it turns out that would also solve the, the biggest problem in the world right now. And we started that with a, with a credit card and no lab uh, on our own on dollars and, and, and spare time, which has gotten less and less and less as the company has started to grow. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's now, I think we filed our first sets of patents in within two weeks of, uh, so very different approach to posterior. We we're very much thinking about what is potential protectable intellectual property and how do you make it a drug that people can then invest in and scale to the world. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that's probably the world record uh, for at least certainly for either of us in terms of going from idea to actual drugs that show some potential effect. I've made a couple of hundred compounds since then. And uh, like Aaron, we're hoping we're planning to be going into some animals in the hopefully not too distant future to show some efficacy and to try and get into human clinical trials next year. Uri, do you want to talk maybe a, a little bit about the <clears throat> experience of starting a completely virtual biotech? Because you started your last biotech company like a decade ago, and it was a super 
different way to build a biotech company. So you've now kind of done it twice, two really different ways. It'd be interesting to hear that perspective. Things are both much harder and much easier when you're um, at the same time. It, the wonderful thing about not having to have an office is that you don't have to commute. So you don't have to like if you if you don't really want to talk to people, it's kind of easy to ignore uh, other people and just put your head down and get work done, except for all the Zoom calls. But you don't have to buy lots of expensive equipment. You don't have to maintain the expensive equipment. You just have to figure out where in the world that equipment lives and how can you get access to it uh, by the hour instead of by the lifetime of the machine. That has a lot of advantages in terms of being uh, flexible in terms of spinning things up and spinning things down. However, it's much, much harder because you don't get the same sense of passion that bleeds off of one person and into another person when everybody's super excited about what they're working on and in the same room. That's, an, to, if you'll pardon the phrase, in the era of COVID, an infectious uh, passion. When people are extraordinarily excited about something, you can feel it. And when you are all on a mission to try and cure something, whether it's hepatitis B or COVID, people come in at all hours to work to get things done. And that makes you feel like you're part of something bigger. It's hard to feel like you're part of, part of something bigger when your interactions are online and on Zoom calls. And so it takes a lot more work to try and build that, but it's still possible in particular because the problem is so big. So the, I think the human element is probably the hardest part in terms of what makes, what will be the more efficient way to do it in the long run. That it, that it will probably evolve as the company evolves. Uri, are there other YC companies that you want to talk about here? Actually, I think it's because of some of the, the work that other YC companies are doing that may, it's made it clear what the opportunity is to start a company for uh, for COVID other than the fact you know medically and the, the medical need is so large. Uh, one of the things that we've seen at YC is this vast number of people turning all sorts of different technologies into diagnostics. Right? And uh, there's there are a bunch of companies that you know, you know, and I'll turn it back over to you to, to maybe mention some of them that have that are making it possible for people to test on, on a scale that wasn't that didn't previously exist, right? whether it's at home testing or devices that people are using to scale up uh, uh, testing from a you know, single bespoke lab to hundreds of thousands of tests at a time. Uh, I think it was at uh, OpenTrons is one of them. We have several diagnostic companies that are, that are, going to, that are changing the landscape. Yes, it's true. Um, we do. Uh, a few of the ones that I'm most excited about, um, there's a company called Billion to One, which today does fetal genetic screening. So they screen for fetal genetic defects and they were able to repurpose some of sort of the core technology that they had developed for that to do COVID diagnostics. And they now have FDA approval to go and do this at scale. And so they're gonna be spinning up labs and doing millions of COVID tests. They, they have the ability to enable lab equipment called Sanger sequencers that are currently not being used for COVID diagnostics to do tons of COVID tests. So it's really increasing um, the testing capacity and Sanger sequencers are all over the world. So it's gonna work all over the world. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> for, uh, for example, our Cyfox, the group that just came through that that's working on building the handheld uh, level diagnostics that would eventually be point of care. Um, the, the, the amazing thing is the diversity and the number of them. And what, what, what 
when you're thinking about what does the world look like three years from now, when all of this technology is out there and now we know there's gonna be this common cold that can kill you. It reminds me of what the flu used to be like. Right? Why, why do we have drugs that can treat the flu? We have drugs that can treat the flu because most people get sick and then get better. A small number of people die. And every once in a while, the flu is really bad and a lot of people die. The common cold, most people used to get the cold and then they'd get better. And then it turns out there was a variation of the cold called COVID or SARS that can kill you. And so in the world that we're gonna be entering, I, most people are gonna get it and I'm gonna get better and a small number are gonna get really sick and a percentage of those people are gonna die. And because we don't know what version of the common cold you have when you first get sick, and because of technologies that are being developed by companies like some of the YC companies and companies like Postera trying to make therapeutics, it's gonna now make sense for people to get tested instead of just saying, oh, I'll brush it off because you don't know if what you're brushing off can make other people really sick, which fundamentally changes the syndrome from sniffles to something that we have to understand and we must be able to treat. And unfortunately, we don't know how long the vaccines are gonna to take to get out and we don't know if they're gonna last for the rest of people's lives. So if the vaccines are not one vaccine and then you're permanently protected, then the only other options that are out there right now are gonna be antibodies and then drugs like what Postera is trying to help put out for the world at a low cost uh, and hopefully Pardes as well. The nice thing about oral drugs is that we can treat millions of people at really low cost equally well in Mumbai and in Tokyo and in New York and in San Francisco without having to worry about needing uh, infusions and doctors and specialized equipment. So at the end of the day, it will be efforts like uh, Aaron's that make it possible to help prevent this from ever happening again at scale. And now I'd like to call John to come up to the stage to ask a couple of questions. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm John Shalowitz. I'm president of SVJP, which is co-sponsor of this event. Um, well, first let me say thank you to YC. Um, you guys um, are a great partner to work with and um, little known fact, uh, prior to becoming the president of uh, SVJP, uh, I spent, um, I, I ran four different startups uh, and actually the last one I ran was a YC uh, company. And I know a lot of the focus of uh, the presentations and the uh, discussions that, that you all have had are mostly around starting a company and the advantage of coming into the YC program and all the great training and, and all the great impact that has on you in terms of setting you off on a great course. Um, I came on uh, after, our, after our B round, um, so later on to be CEO. Um, but what I can say is, well, two things. So one, um, having run three companies prior, the, the rigor and the impact that YC had was clearly, clearly visible compared to the other companies that, that I ran. So again, uh, didn't, don't, make, don't mean to make this a plug or a commercial, but I really think you guys do an amazing job getting people set up, um, the, the quality of the product, all the stuff that, that had to be done, that you wish were done, had been done. Um, so it was just really great to come on board and do that. Um, the other thing I could say is that as a CEO of a later stage YC company, um, the network was just amazing. I mean, I could, I could pick up the phone, I could send an email to thousands of different startups and uh, without fail, they would at least respond. And that's, you know, as a, as a CEO of a, of a growing startup, you know, finding new customers, oftentimes your best customers are other startups like you or other later stage startups. So um, uh, it was just indispensable having that network and, uh, I could talk hours about that, and maybe I will, but not not today, because I don't want to uh, I don't want to diminish uh, the impact of what um, Aaron and Enri, what you guys are doing. Uh, I'm in real awe having run um, uh, deep tech uh, software startups 
you know, people that create startups that save lives is just, you know, I get goose, goosebumps when I hear that. Um, so, so let me ask one question. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll direct this to Aaron because it's 4 a.m. and and why not your time? Uh, so why not start with you? So um, and 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 also congratulations on pivoting and and sort of getting all hands on deck to solve an amazingly important problem. Um, you know the question is getting into the pivot. Oftentimes pivoting the company is really hard as I've had the challenge in the past um, for various reasons, inertia, whatnot. Um, you had such an obvious uh, cause to solve or problem to solve. I'm, I'm guessing it was somewhat easier than, than normal to pivot the company. Um, once we hope a lot of this is behind us and we're sort of back into somewhat steady stream, how do you keep that momentum and that excitement sort of when all the dust settles? And, and yes, I think it sounds like you're well poised for the next coronavirus or the next big challenge, but there's always that sort of step back when you're, you know, you sort of, you, you had all the excitement getting to that point. Have you thought about that yet? Or are you just pretty much thinking about your first cup of coffee of the day and, <laughs> and what you have to do the next three hours? Um, I think that could be kind of interesting to hear. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think what I'd say is posterior stance is that we will not become an infectious disease company. Um, we passionately care about the issue. Uh, in, in fact, when I met Yuri and Jared, I spent a lot of time talking about antibiotics, which they had to kind of help me reframe my thinking. But no, nonetheless, I think posterior's contribution is more the um, uh, the machine learning and the kind of data infrastructure that we have built for COVID Moonshot. So I think our kind of like medium term intention when the dust settles, as you put it, is to be able to take this kind of like web platform and infrastructure and be able to offer it to other organizations that have now sprouted up who would like to take the same style of open source approach and apply it to other areas that tend to be underfunded and that tend to be overlooked in the drug discovery scene. Um, I think the kind of tools, particularly around how to make compounds and how to find the correct chemical manufacturers to make your compounds, um, as I mentioned earlier, is a tool that we just released last week that we hope will help the world. So I think from posterior's perspective, we see our major contribution going forward, probably in the area of the tooling and the infrastructure, as opposed to the direct therapeutics themselves. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, let me turn it back over to other questions. I think there, there may be a few other ones or we may be out of time because I spoke too long, but. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to ask these questions. So maybe I, I will ask one unless, uh, do we know Jared or Uri, are we supposed to just keep going now or are we supposed to move on or? I am, I am awaiting further instructions. Okay, I said Kat's coming on. Hi, yeah, I think we're going to be transitioning into the Q&A portion next. Um, yeah. I have someone who's going to be asking the very first question. So there is a contributor, uh, Mr. Umada, uh, who's contributing to uh, via the questionnaire. So okay. please welcome Umada-san. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for the great presentation to all and sharing the wisdom for startups. Okay, um, on behalf of the audience, uh, let me ask first the first question to you. And uh, before that, let me uh, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm the director of the like, official of an official university accelerator at the University of Tokyo, and a lecturer for entrepreneurship at the university. So I meet so many people who have like a laugh and the early stage idea. And there, I remember Kat pointed out um, the three important things to like build a great company like this. So can, you see, can you see this? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, yesterday I think Paul Graham uh, published a new essay and there he talked about the new ideas and the, the new idea is Usually, like a strange. You're muted.
Mute. Sorry. Okay. Um, so according to the latest like polygram essay, so he published on like a new essay yesterday, I think, and he suggested a new idea is are sometimes like strange sound, and sometimes lame. So I think every founder needs to like clarify their ideas. So how how did you clarify your idea in the like early stage of the idea? And Kat said, I think group office hour helps like uh, many founders to clarify the idea, their ideas. But uh, do you have any other ways to clarify the idea, or how did you clarify? It? This is a yeah. question. Well, yeah. I'd love to, um, when I was listening to, you know, Joey and Ivana on the panel, um, I, uh, they talked a lot about um, how to, you know, talk about their idea and what they were building to um, investors and, and, you know, people that weren't from their academic background that didn't have, you know, deep technical knowledge in their spaces. So if I could turn it over to um, Ivana and Joey, what were ways that helped you kind of learn how to better communicate what you were building um, to people that, you know, uh, might not have the deep technical expertise in, in, you know, both of your fields? Yeah, I can go first, or you go first, you want to? Yeah, I, I have to call the YC office hours and the groups that we we did over over the summer and uh, just how much emphasis was placed on uh, the clarity of the message and the one liners, the one liner intros to your company. And so it was just really practicing and practicing over the summer in groups, but also talking to others outside of that um, of that immediate group and, you know, just crystallizing that message by talking to people outside of your field. Um, and it really has to be clear to people outside of your field or else is, yeah, uh, too complicated, so. No, no, totally. I mean, for me, it was pain and suffering, right? Like Uri and Jared were just relentless when it came to how awful my one-liner was. And I think that's good, right? Like you need you need that kind of immediate feedback on like, this is not working and there's nothing worse, right? Than speaking to a potential hire or God forbid an investor where you're like pouring your heart out and they just don't get it. Like it's, <laughs> it is, it's, it's an atrocious feeling. So I think, um, and I think to your point, Ivana, like, again, you know, my background is, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, my PhD is in computer science, but I was around biologists and pharmacology folks for, forever being around a bunch, you know, YC community, which is definitely not my field. I had to get really, really good at communicating very complex deep tech ideas about, you know, genetics to folks who have heard about DNA, but maybe through only Jurassic Park, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uri and Jared, do you have anything else to add that during a group office hours, you uh, hammer the companies with? No jargon. I think that the, the escape route that many very smart people take, because they are smart, they know this very special set of magic words. And by using those magic words, they get immediately rewarded that other people think they're smart. But they have to pay the price that people don't understand what they're saying. And you, you have to learn that there's actually some prices that are not worth paying. And it's okay if people don't immediately say, wow, you're smart. They can, if, but instead if they get there by understanding, wow, this is a really brilliant idea. And you could say it in really simple words. And, make, and forcing people to practice that over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. It's it's not a problem that ends at the seed stage. So recently, um, Janelle Tam, who uh, helps run our Series A program at YC, wrote a big guide on uh, you know how to make a great Series A pitch and deck. And she posted it on Hacker News. And one of the top comments on Hacker News was from an investor who said, Listen, like the first thing we need to we need, you know, here is to understand what you're even doing. 
um, before we can invest in you or before we can ask good questions. And so um, I just thought it was interesting that it was, it's not a problem that ends after YC, after the seed stage. It's like, it's a, you know, you have to keep kind of practicing it even, you know, into perpetuity, basically. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great advice to all the founders, all the Japanese founders. Okay, so could you pick up your questions from the audience? Yes, so um, I'm going to uh, read out the questions and, and then um, I think we have, um, and then I'll, I'll just kind of direct them or if, if you want to um, answer any of the alum or, or in Jared, just feel free to jump in. Um, so let's see. The first question, um, and feel free to, you know, dump more questions into the chat and, and then I can kind of um, choose from there. Um, but let's see, considering, let's see, um, considering the geopolitical situation between the US and China, um, would there be some impact on startups in Japan which pursue their market globally? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, we haven't really seen, you know, a negative impact from any of the uh, sort of companies that we've worked with that have, you know, started in the Korean market or started in specific, you know, markets and, and focused and then and then kind of launched more globally or launched in the U.S. Um, would there be something specific that you want to add in there, Jared or Uri? Uh, uh, so I'll say on the contrary. You know, it may be particularly in the context of biotech and deep tech startups. Uh, those are by definition, really big ideas. The bigger an idea is, the less geopolitics matter, right? People don't want to die of cancer. It doesn't make a difference where in the world you are. People don't want to die of infectious diseases. People want to be able to fly on rocket ships. Right? These are all big questions and geopolitics matters less there. All right, um, I'm gonna jump into a question for the alum. Um, so uh, how important is traction at the time of um, application to get into YC? So I, what I want here is to um, is for each of the alum to kind of talk a little bit about, and, and I know you talked about this in your panels, but to briefly just say where you were at when you sent in the application to YC, just to give sort of an idea of the spectrum that exists. Ivana. Yeah, uh, so uh, we had no traction, no data, you know, just like I said, we, you know, we, we, we just left our jobs and, and uh, uh, were, um, you know, our first uh, interview was the YC, uh, or, you know, YC interview, <laughs> the 10 minute uh, interview. So yeah, I, I think that was, um, you know, one of the great things uh, about YC is just uh, being able to, you know, to accept, uh, you know, our uh, myself and my co-founder into the program uh, based on uh, based on the idea, based on uh, just our, our collective experiences and um, and answers to some of these you know, tricky questions that they put in the application. So, um, so yeah, that's that's our story. <laughs> no traction. <laughs> Joey. We had traction. Um, I remember in my interview, it was like pre YC, so I wasn't good at my one liners or or any communication really. And uh, Paul was in my interview along with Jared, and he was like, "I don't understand what you're saying," but he was like, "On here it says you have customers, right?" I was like, "Oh yeah, no, we do. We have those." And uh, <laughs> and it's like, "So what do you do for them?" And I was like, "Ah, oh, great, thank God, I can I can talk about that." Um, so I think you know, for for us, where it was. I mean, we had a very complicated idea, but what we did, we had traction. And I think that helped validate the technology and validate our team, our idea. So um, I think for, for us, it was really, really important. And um, as I said, during our, our shtick, um, I think the post seed, it was also really important, especially um, from Silicon Valley VC that are, again, are not as um, biotech savvy or science, science based. Um, to see that kind of laundry list of, you know, these are the pharma companies that we've worked with. And, um, you know, this is, these are our revenue numbers. And I think that kind of, that it really did help us a lot. Um, so, so yeah, we have traction. Aaron. Uh, yeah, I think 
we had so little traction that we didn't even think about applying to YC. It was actually uh, Yuri that reached out to myself and our co-founders after we we published a paper uh, which was centered around using machine learning for chemical synthesis. And so again, not to pat YC on the back and plug you guys too much, but we just had so much respect for that kind of outreach approach. Um, so I think we had an idea, we had it validated, at least the mathematical framework was validated in an academic paper. And um, that was basically all we had. I think we were figuring out, do we make drugs? Do we sell tools to people? What is the business model? Who are the clients? And that was where YC, I felt, became incredibly instrumental at helping us guide all of that thinking. But yeah, we turned up to the 10 minute interview with an academic paper. And, and um, I think it's about 40% of the companies we fund have a launched product, but 60% of the companies we fund um, do not, um, don't have anything launched yet and might have a prototype, might have an academic paper. Um, but a lot of folks always ask, like, you know, when is the exact right time to apply to YC? And, and I really don't think the exact right time exists. So um, I'm, I'm glad you all, you all had sort of a range of experiences there. Um, let's jump into, uh, you know, maybe you talked a lot about this a little bit or yesterday, um, but um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you see or what, what, what you're excited about in the Japanese market and why there's a lot of opportunity here, um, you know, in Japan? So the so this, this is you know related to the global question, but to, but a little bit the inverse. Every region has its own magic, right? Uh, so Silicon Valley people think about things a certain way, and it's useful for some things. Uh, in the Jap in Japanese culture in Japan, people think about there, there are certain subsets of things which are just embraced very differently. I'll give one example that I've always really admired. Uh, it's gonna and it's gonna sound a little bit weird, but there's a different relationship with ghosts in Japan and figure and the idea of uh, ancestors being and ghosts being beneficial versus in. Europe and the US where ghosts are scary and uh, that people are looking down and scolding you and from heaven, not necessarily help, not your ancestors aren't necessarily helping you move forward. And that actually pays dividends when you come to think about things like artificial intelligence, when you come to think about things like robotics and design, how do you interact with non-human uh, inanimate or otherwise animated things? One of the reasons why I think Japan's actually excelled in that space is because people are coming at it from a different sense of what is possible and what should be possible. Uh, the, there's a lot of uh, old tropes as well and that, that are on the, the idea of excellence in Japan and, you know, and artisanry, things get refined to an incredible level, which is reflected in, uh, across many different areas. I think the, it, when you build something, when the idea is to build something beautiful at, at an extremely elegant level, that's not just in the context of making art, but that's in the context of making code, that's in the context of building companies. So there's a tremendous amount of potential in harnessing the way that a culture looks at the world. And I think that Japan's doing a fantastic job and there's no, to better, there's no limit. All right, um, thank you. Um, Here's a question for, um, I'll throw it out to any of you. So um, are, do you have any advice for founders who are trying to meet angels and VCs during COVID? Like what is the best way um, to get connected? Any thoughts here? Um, maybe I can just give a little bit of, uh, I guess, advice from, from our experience. So I would prioritize any warm introductions that you can get. Um, the, the, the magic of warm introductions cannot be overstated, in my opinion, from having gone from uh, 
zero to uh, a company that's just about alive and, and functioning at the minute. Um, so my, my encouragement is before trying to get a list of 100 angels and VCs and sending mass emails, just try and leverage the network you already have. And I promise you, your network is bigger than you think it is. You just haven't yet explored it. There will be somebody who has spoken to an investor before. There will be a professor in your lab who started a startup kind of 10 years ago. And I have found that those warm introductions, particularly if you don't have significant traction yet that you can write down, just really helps get that foot in the door. So it's a super basic, simple piece of advice, but rather than the mass emails, if you can start out with the warm introduction from your network and people you know, we found that was particularly helpful. I think that's super helpful. Yes. Thank you. Um, so for the startup founders, um, what has been the most sort of serious issue, um, you know, f that you faced during COVID? Um, and this question is actually also, you know, for what's the most serious issue that you'll face post COVID? I'm not even sure if you're thinking post COVID yet, but um, so what's the most serious issue that you've been uh, challenge you've faced in the past six months? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a contradiction. So when when COVID happened, all of our uh, investors were like, don't spend any money, save everything, because you never know. And I was like, yes, I get that. I'm, I'm already a conservative leaning person when it comes to finances. So I was like, I'm not going to do anything. But then all of these wonderful things started happening in our company. We started, we 2x the number of partner deals we had. We have two drug programs that we're really excited about and we needed to hire. <laughs> um, so we're hiring in COVID and we, we're very fortunate that we, we raised right before COVID happened. Um, but hiring in the Zoom era is a really challenging um, problem, right? While also trying to think about burn and the impending doom of the pandemic, right? It's this really weird kind of like, we need to grow, but we don't wanna grow that fast because you never know um i'm not sure we've solved it um quite yet but we have we have to get people you know in the lab generating data and um and and so so hiring during COVID has been has been challenging you know we we've hired two scientists in the last four months you know um maybe it's because i'm picky i don't know um but it's it's hard to get a feel for folks over zoom you know and and even if, and if the person's remote, it's really challenging too. We hired a computational med chemist recently. He works solely out of his place in Boston. And, you know, that's worked out really well. Um, but it was, I think, eight interviews. <laughs> you know, he like met with all the team members and I talked to him three times, you know, because we use, you know, it's, you, you can't, you can't be there in person. Um, so I think this is, this has been a challenge for, for, for us. Yeah. Ivana. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would uh, point out the hiring. Yes, it's definitely um, is, is a challenge and then integrating the new team members, right? You know, everyone's wearing masks, you know, you can't, you know, you can't see people's faces as easily anymore in person, right? And just, uh, um, so it's, it's, you know, there's, um, there's definitely, um, it's a learning curve, right? How do you, you know, uh, integrate the new hires uh, in this era. Uh, something else that, uh, you know, we uh, were thinking about is just unexpected delays. You know, you have to build in some time, uh, some additional time in your timeline, you know, uh, for, for, for things that are not immediately under your control, like working with CROs. Um, look, turns out there is a shortage of monkeys uh, right now. And so it's and not as monkey studies, right? Uh, and so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's, you know, there's certain things that are not under, you know, yes, everyone in our company comes and works uh, and, and does experiments, but you, you don't know that this, you know, this, this is going to be the same in the CROs that are you working with and, and collaborations, you know, we have a collaborator in Amsterdam that, you know, uh, COVID is now spiking there and they're about to shut down the labs, right? So, you know, I think there are are these unexpected uh, delays that and, and just building in a little more time to your timeline would be wise. Yeah. 
And Aaron, anything you wanted to add? Um, maybe I'll just add kind of how post you was thinking post COVID and I totally echo what uh, Ivana and Joey have mentioned. Um, I think that if you are starting out in the life sciences or the biotech scene, and from day one, you don't have a specific therapeutic area that you're targeting or a specific drug that you want to develop, then your business model becomes incredibly important to think about. And so from posterior's perspective, the challenge post-COVID is to continue to really refine the actual kind of focus and business model because what we've experienced even through COVID moonshot is that there has been a significant amount of supply chain disruption during the pandemic at the very time that you would generally want it to be functioning at its best. And so we just want to think very carefully about how reliant do we want to be on a supply chain how much do we want to internalize either experiments, chemical manufacturing itself? How much of the outsourcing that Yuri mentioned is now possible do you want to exploit at the risk that your program could be inhibited by someone else? And so we have just thought long and hard as a company as when COVID does finish, um, how do we evolve or stick with the current business model that we do have? Because I think if you're a SaaS founder, you can just say to yourself, my market is big enough and I just have to achieve scale and network effects. I think those common concepts are maybe less obvious in the biotech and life sciences scene. And so I just encourage founders to really think kind of around the business model when, when you're starting out. And here's a, this next question is about how did you choose where to headquarter your company? Um, so, you know, how did you choose to, you know, go back to the UK or um, how did you decide where you wanted to run your startups? Oh, well, I got a lot of, I got a lot of grief for it um, in the, in, during the YC because so, uh, our Boulder, or, so our, our company is founded in Boulder, Colorado, um, which is, we're a small burgeoning biotech scene, but we're certainly nothing like San Francisco or Boston. And um, even some of my seed investors who um, were concerned, they were like, Joey, how can you recruit in the Midwest or in the West? Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, we've spent a lot of time looking for good recruiters, right? Um, so that's been, been one thing that we spent a lot of time on. I interview recruiters. But then another time is, um, you know, if you're spending... 70 hours a week on your startup, you need to live, I, I feel that you need outlets for which you can de-start up, you know, and, and decompress and spend time. For me, it's outside. And, um, and in that way, um, I feel really lucky and fortunate that we're building Arpeggio, our company in Boulder. Um, not to say that San Francisco and Boston aren't great cities, um, but for me, um, Boulder just made more sense, yeah. And Ivana, and uh, how about you? Um, yeah, I guess we we didn't have a choice. You know, we were already in and lucky enough to 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 be uh, in 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 the Silicon Valley and and this Bay Area. And so, yeah, it, it just um, it was it was the it was the right it was the right place to to start a company <laughs> for us. Yeah. And Aaron, how did you end up back in the UK? Uh, so we are still a U.S. company with the majority of our employees all in the U.S. Um, I am in the U.K. because I'm trying to get a visa back into the U.S. Um, but I think to, to Yuri's point, one thing I will comment on is the strength of certain cultures that often are present in given geographical locations. So we started the company in London, but then moved it to the U.S. And I think that was because as much as I love the UK and London, um, London tends to be great for kind of very large established institutions like banking, like law, like consultancy. But when you're doing a startup, we just loved the kind of pace and fervency that you got in the kind of Silicon Valley area. And we wanted that culture to kind of leak into everything we did within Postura. 
So for us, it was very much a cultural choice um, around the people that we hired, also where our clients were, um, also been near um, the kind of growing tech scene, uh, sorry, the biotech scene, both on the West Coast and the East Coast. So I think for us, we moved from the UK to the US because of that culture we wanted to imbue within Posterior, which um, we just think was a particular feature that Silicon Valley does really great. And uh, we wanted to kind of hang around that. And, and traditionally, I think a lot of, you know, companies and YC companies um, are, you know, we, we tell folks to go to where their customers are, to go to where, you know, to, to be as, as close to their potential customers or, you know, where all the talent is that, you know, you might want to hire. So that's, that's the general advice and, um, for that. Um, so we are just at about one minute. Um, and so I, uh, let's do one more question. Um, so there is a, a question here about, um, you know, there's someone in the audience that really wants to start a startup, but they haven't come across the idea that makes them think like, this is it, I should quit my job. I should, you know, start working on this full time, you know, as soon as I get out of school. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you came across the idea that made you officially decide to start a company? I know you kind of, um, answered this a little bit, um, Ivana and uh, Joey, uh, in your panel, but so maybe we'll start with Aaron. And then if you guys want to add anything else, that'd be great. Uh, sure. So I think uh, we definitely did distinctly have a moment. Um, I was working actually in investment banking at the time, doing a mix of machine learning and trading. And I had a long term friend who is a professor at Cambridge University who had been publishing some really cool papers in the area of machine learning for drug discovery. He was frustrated because there was no real world application of his technology. I was frustrated because I was kind of like, uh, I can do more good for the world than just sat behind a trading desk. And we basically had this realization, oh, it looks like a company may be the best vehicle to take your research and apply it in a real world context that is going to help a load of people. So we were literally sat in the office in the investment bank talking about this. I drove to Cambridge the next weekend and we decided to start a company sat in some cafe in, in Cambridge. So I think that, that was kind of really nice uh, joining together of two different people's frustrations into a very clear solution. That's cool. Ivana, anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I, I, I think... You know, like I said earlier, I had several, you know, several different times in my career when I, you know, came across an idea and I was like, oh, that would be a good idea to start a company. But it's just there was that was it. Right. There was, you know, um, um, no, you know, I, I was was not in Silicon Valley. I was not connected to to a seat investor. I didn't have the right, you know, uh, people in the field. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to wait for that right opportunity. Um, uh, but um, what specifically helped me uh, with this idea was, um, you know, there was a lot of data available um, in the clinic on prior drugs. And so it was really looking at that clinical data and it was most of it was public, you know, really just um, looking at published uh, papers on why these, you know, what happened to patients that took, took these drugs, you know, what their immune system looked like after they took these drugs and how that data didn't really match up uh, what um, what was done in mouse models and monkeys. And so, you know, that allowed us to, to, to create a hypothesis, you know, well, you know, maybe this is why it, it didn't work in patients as well as in, in mice. And, and then that was number one. And so, so you were relying on clinical data, right, uh, to, uh, to generate an, an idea. And two was just uh, spelling out what it would take to de-risk it, right? And how fast could it be de-risked? And, and it just clicked that, you know, this could be de-risked in a short amount of time. And, um, and it wasn't a very complicated, in the end, um, idea. It was, um, in, in the end, you know, it, it, it would be just a simple next step to what's already um, been available, right? So that was, um, yeah, that was our story. You know, really, you could, you could in a you know, short amount of time, say, yes, this is correct or not. It wasn't a very complicated idea, says the startup founder who's trying to cure cancer. <laughs> okay. uh, 
be clear on that. <laughs> yeah. After you go through all the background slides, you know, then you'll, oh, that's what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Joey. Um, yeah, no, I think I just might leave it with a piece of advice because that question reminded me of something which is, um, and I, again, this is just my advice, right, from my unique experience, take it for what it's worth. But I would never start a company just to start a company, right? Um, I think you you start a company, I think my advice is to wait for that idea to come and be patient. I, you know, we're all passionate people and that idea will come to you soon uh, or eventually. And, um, and you need that passion because, uh, you know, when an early employee quits or an investor decides to pull out or an experiment fails, like you're not just doing it because you're starting a company, you're doing it because you believe in the idea, you know, or um, Yvonne's case, you're curing cancer or Aaron's case, you're curing COVID, you know, it's like um, you're doing it because you believe in, you believe in it. Um, and so starting a company is really, really hard. And if you do it just because you want to be a founder, um, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> I think that's a great uh, piece of advice to leave it on. And I want to thank the three of you and Uri and Jared um, for, you know, sharing all your thoughts and, and your stories tonight. Thank you guys so much. It was really cool to hear from all of you. Thank you.